We're so glad that you're here. I'm Beth Davis, and this is my dear friend, Father John Burns. Hi, Father. Welcome. Hey, Beth. Hey, everybody. How are you? Good. We're so glad to be with all of you. We've been um, praying and anticipating this time together for a couple of months now, and we just want to welcome you especially. Thanks for taking the time to be with us, to pray with us. I know this conversation is going to bless you no matter your vocation or state in life. In fact, we, um, as we designed this, what will be a series called Come and See, uh, we had every woman in the Blessed Ishi community in mind. We want to reach out to women who are discerning religious life. We want to be a resource for moms of girls who may one day discern religious life. And we want to support, encourage, and um, just champion our dear beloved sisters who are living a vocation to the religious life. So there's something in here for everyone. And I know, Father, your talk today is going to be a blessing to all of us. So thanks for being with us. Yeah, such a gift, Beth. <clears throat> I'm totally honored. This is such, a, such an important topic and one that is really, really deep in my heart. So I could not be happier to uh, get, this, <clears throat> get this started with you all. Yeah, we feel the same way. Father, could I ask you to introduce yourself? Maybe tell yeah, us sure. a little bit about yeah, why this uh, topic just burns in your heart. Yeah, so name is Father John Burns. I'm a priest, a diocesan priest uh, in the Archdiocese of Milwaukee. And my assignments, I work half time for the vocations office, working with young men discerning priesthood. And the other half of my time is spent working with uh, women who are discerning religious vocations and also helping to preach retreats and really build up consecrated women's religious life in, in the U S. Um, and that second half is really, it's unique. It's bishops, the only bishop in the country who's just a priest to that work, um, because he sees with me as well, the importance of, uh, just making sure we have like a very strong and vivid depiction of the bride in, in the local churches that a religious woman can say and do things that no priest can say and do and, and no lay person can. She has a certain entrance into the heart of Christ and a, a deep intimate knowledge of Christ in a manner that allows her to speak for her beloved um, on behalf of and to the church in a way that is stunning to behold. Um, and if you've, if you've been around sisters um, in person and have had a chance to interact with them, sisters who are just really living fully and freely this great love it's captivating. Like there's just something different about the way they speak, the way they witness to Christ and the way they call us toward him. That I think if we don't have that in every diocese in the country and throughout the world, we're always going to be kind of poor or sick or missing something essential. So it's, it feels like it's my life's mission to, to build that up and to make sure that it's, it's just a patient constantly, that it's on our radar screens. And it's also uh, where it exists already well and in these stable communities where it's, it can be blessed um, ever more deeply. So yeah, just the deepest thing in my heart is the renewal of the church through the renewal of women's religious life. Yeah, thank you so much, Father. I um, uh, wish I was taking notes even during that introduction. I feel like I already heard things that resonated with me and uh, just made me love Christ and the church more. So uh, we're just so grateful that you're here and so grateful to all of you for joining us. Of course, I'm gonna be hanging out with you in the comments over here all throughout the talk. So feel free to interact. We always want to build up uh, one another and support each other in community. Uh, you know, Blessed is She is all about prayer and community, and we don't want you to have to discern things or, or follow the Lord's voice, uh, his call in your life alone. So we're here to support you. Jenna's there chatting, and we would love uh, to interact with you. As always, if you have any questions during the talk, leave them there. And after Father Burns speaks, I'll come back on the screen and we'll be able to uh, kind of go back and forth and have a little Q&A, bring some of your questions, some questions from Instagram earlier this week as well. Uh, so hang out with us there. In fact, why don't you tell us right now where you're watching from? And I love this question, Jenna, what brings you here today? And of course, uh, we'll be there to chat with you all throughout and back again at the end. So Father, before we begin, uh, could we just start with a prayer and then I'll hand things over to you? Of course. Okay, yeah, let's, let's pray. pray. <clears throat> the name of the, the Father. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
Good and gracious God, we place ourselves in your presence and we ask you to inspire us. We acknowledge within and before your gaze, the place we find ourselves, our hearts carrying whatever they carry and open to this question, this conversation about religious vocational discernment. And with all of the expectation, with all of the joy, with all the fear, all the uncertainty, everything we, we bear within us, Lord, we just surrender to you and we consent to your goodness. We welcome it, knowing how much we need you. By this prayer, Lord, we just place our lives in you and we ask you to do with us whatever you want and to teach us, please, how to love what you love and how to want what you want for our lives and for the world. Guide us, please, by your Holy Spirit in the time we share and into living all of this out to the fullness. We ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, Father, yes. I'm going to hand things over to you, and I'll see you in just a bit. Beauty. <clears throat> I would just like to redouble that, uh, that word of welcome, and, and really, wherever you find yourself today as you join us, just to, to really acknowledge this is a this is no small thing, you know, to to take some time out of a Saturday and engage a conversation about religious discernment, um, especially in today's culture in our world. Uh, it can seem like a crazy idea, and um, maybe in communities it can seem sort of um, yeah, like it doesn't make any sense. But I suspect, at least for for some of you, you're here because you felt that not making sense, but you also felt something within, <laughs> and you can't explain it, and you can't explain it away. And it doesn't really quiet down, but it sort of invites you to look at it, to ponder it, and to carry it. And that's the beginning of, of vocational discernment. And that's what I want to talk about with you today. Um, so just first off, that yeah, affirmation, I'm just grateful that you're here and that you're open to this conversation um, and open to an encouraging discernment of a vocation within your families, maybe among your children if you're a parent, um, but also in your own life and among your, your friends. And we'll get to a couple of those different details eventually. At the start, I would just say, you know, I work with a lot of men and a lot of women who are discerning vocations. And one of the biggest kind of first steps around the question, what's my life made for, is to, to look inward and ask ourselves where we're searching for an answer for that. What we're all trying to figure out is who we are, you know, um, it, it kind of on a, a lot of different levels. Like, who am I? What am I supposed to be? What's my life supposed to look like? How am I supposed to live in order to be happy? And it's a search for identity. It's a search for wanting to know ourselves and wanting to know who we're supposed to be and, and what's going to fulfill us. In, in my own journey, my, my vocational journey, I sought the answer to that question for many years in, in a lot of the wrong places. I was looking to other people to define my worth or to tell me what I'm worth. I was looking to achievements, uh, to, to positions or honor in the world, <clears throat> looking to adventures. After college, I went backpacking for five months through Asia and Australia. I was trying to find myself. And um, real briefly, it was, I ended up on a, a shrimp boat. It's a crazy story. I ran out of money and took a job on a prawn trawler. They fished for giant shrimp. Spent a month out there. And uh, near the end of it, the stars late at night. And I realized that all the way across the world um, on this adventure that seemed to have all these things that would satisfy my heart about living on the edge and, and having this kind of wild life, I realized it was still my heart that I bore all the way across the world. And I had all the very same questions that I had while I was sitting at home before I even set out to make this voyage. And it, it took a really big decision on my part, not to, to discern the priesthood even, but to decide to look for my identity in God and to take, as it were, my attention off myself and just look at the Lord. And, and rather than trying to measure my own interests and my hobbies and my passions, taking stock of all that, I chose instead to just look at the Lord and say, Lord, here I am. How do you see me? And to, to take time to look at God looking at me and discover there something about who I'm, who I'm meant to be, who I'm not yet, but who I'm becoming and who I could become. Because our identity, our fullness, always, it lies in the basic reality that we're sons and daughters of God, the perfect father. And then he wants to bring something out of that that is very specific. That we know if you've, if you've studied in the church documents in the last several decades, <clears throat> we know that every person is called to holiness. It's, since Vatican II, we call it the universal call to holiness. Everyone is called to be a saint. But that's general. That's generic. It becomes personal. Uh, as we discover that God has spoken our lives a way toward himself. And that's how we kind of define a vocation is that it's a, a movement toward 
heaven, and it's the pathway set by God that will most suitably help us reach heaven and along the way to experience um, the deepest joy possible here on earth, the, the partial joy that's possible while we're in the flesh, but that's moving us toward heaven. That's that's how we define a vocation. It's rooted in the word uh, vox, a Latin word, which we also hear voce. Um, it means voice. And a vocation is a calling. Um, it's a calling from God to himself, to heaven. And it takes a very personal shape for each of us to it. But each of us have a, a very special shape. And, uh, and that's what we're going to hear to discuss. I've got a little leg on the video. I'm just going to open the door here. Apologies. Just in case your um, signal or my signal is not coming through well. So um, the first thing I would lay out there, that's how we define a vocation. It's a calling from God to God, a pathway to heaven, and, and a way to live a full Christ-like life here on earth. One of the, the first questions that I get asked all the time when this conversation comes up is, um, or even maybe the first response, especially among high schoolers, talk about vocations. And this is among the girls, but I'm, I'll support the guys on this question. And they'll always say, you know, Father, I know that I'm not called to be a priest. I'm like, okay, excellent. You're 16 years old and you know God's will for your life. You've got something that most of the rest of the world doesn't have yet. Tell me how you got there. And consistently the guys are like, oh, I just, you know, I like girls so much. I love babies. And so I, I know I'm called to marriage. And uh, it's, it's classic how often that response comes. And I've just come to look at those guys now and say, you know, congratulations. You have told me nothing except that you're alive, that you're a human being, that you're a man, and feelings and emotions and passions. And, and that's just going on for you. Um, and I, that's kind of a very important principle that I want to put out at the very beginning of, of our conversation about desire and, and vocation. Because the, the culture and even maybe sometimes within the church, we say things like follow your heart or search your desires, or um, yeah, what do you want the most out of life? And that will tell you something about God's calling. It can, for sure, because God increases holy desires in us, especially when we welcome him to do that work. But, but there's also this reality about desire that can be very confusing. These guys, and again, I said women say the same thing in high school and college. These men and women who um, are sure of a call to marriage because they like men or women and they like babies. They're confused about what desire actually is and what it's telling us. And this is what's so very important to parse out. I wanna walk through a little bit of philosophy with you. We all have built into us a desire by nature. It's called a natural inclination toward marriage, toward giving ourselves to another and toward raising children and educating them um, with that other. It's built into us. It's natural in us to be drawn toward it. If that's the calling on our lives, if that's the way that will be uh, the fullest pursuit of heaven for us, then what happens is that natural desire, as we um, engage the life of faith and engage courtship, holy courtship, and are discerning about the types of people we date <clears throat> and how we date them, eventually um, the Lord invites us to sacramentalize the natural bond that has grown between the man and the woman. And that's called holy matrimony or marriage. That a man and a woman who come to the altar um, have been living on a natural desire that has drawn them to recognize that it rises to the level of a calling to holiness through laying down their lives for each other and making vows uh, before the church, before God to one another to be faithful. Um, that's marriage. But you have this sort of sequence toward that from nature to supernature, that it's built into us to want that. And then very often um, we sacramentalize it and it becomes uh, holy matrimony, which we talk about as one of the major vocations. What's different for the consecrated man or woman, um, the consecrated virgin or the religious sister or the nun, those are all different states. And we may go into that later on. But what's different there is um, I think we kind of approach uh, those vocations and say, well, you're not going to be married and so you have to figure out how to live without those desires. Or, or maybe someday God is going to call you to set aside everything in you that feels so natural and is so strong, the desire for a husband and for children. God's going to tell you to, to put that all away and be his. And that's just not quite right. And here's why. God put these desires in us. They're, they're natural desires. It's an innate longing. And God doesn't do violence to nature. God God doesn't like cut off things he put there, expect us to live without them. What happens for the, the woman that he calls to himself in a consecrated vocation is he gives to her a special gift. And the gift 
is sometimes called a charism, but it's, it's a special grace to live in a different way. And I want to just quote the scriptures on this, because uh, Jesus te teaches about this very directly in a passage that I think we kind of pass over a lot of the time. It's in Matthew chapter 19. And he says this, he's in a conversation with the Pharisees about uh, divorce and marriage. And at the end of it, the disciples turn to him and they're like, Lord, if this is the case, because he's talking about how easy it is to commit adultery. They say, Lord, if this is the case, maybe it's better just to not get married. And Jesus says this, not everyone can accept this teaching, but only those to whom it is given. For there are some who are celibate who've been so from birth. There are some celibates who have been made so by men. And there are some celibates who have made themselves so for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. He who is able to receive this, let him receive it. It's a very beautiful teaching there that we um, skip over, like I said, or just don't really pay heed to significantly enough. The Lord is saying two things there. The first, that not everyone is called to celibacy. Not everyone is called to celibacy. Um, he says it's a gift, that it's only given to some. And this is a great liberty as you stand at the threshold of a discernment journey, or if you have children who are doing so, that not everyone is called to celibacy. And, and by extension, what that means is, um, if you're not called to celibacy, God is not going to ask you to be celibate, <laughs> as obvious as that sounds. But let me unpack that for you. Sometimes people have this sense that like, I have to do the hardest thing. I have to, to do the most. I have to do the thing that's going to make me maybe suffer or is going to represent the greatest sacrifice. And all those things are true, but they get twisted a little bit into confusing us about vocations. We do always want to be the most generous. We want to give our lives to God better today than yesterday and each day henceforward increasingly in perfection. We want, to, we want to exist for God and let him transform our lives so the world is transformed by the gospel. We want to be as generous as possible there. And so at times, that generosity entails being direct with God and saying, God, if you want me to be a priest in my case or a religious woman in your case, I'm willing. And yes, it scares me to death. It's not even really attractive to me right now. I don't even think I could do it, but I'm willing. Because what we're doing there is making a generous offering to God. And God is not going to call us to something that isn't for us. He's not going to make us do something that's not going to bring us joy. And that's the little road bump that we just really have to get over on the front end of this. That if you're here, why ever you're here, really, for whatever reason. But if you're here because you have this kind of haunting little ache and you've thought about it and it's popped up in your mind or prayer over the years and you don't know what to do about it, that very well could be God calling you to himself. But you don't have to be afraid of that right now, first and foremost, because it's a very long process to get there. And second of all, if it really is God's calling, as Jesus tells us, it's a gift. And, and gifts are given by a perfect God to bless us. And so if that gift is there, it's actually a great treasure. And it would, in the end, be a great sorrow to not open a treasure given to you by God. But then again, it's not given to everyone. And so you just don't have to quite worry right now about whether or not you someday have to make this great sacrifice. What you have to worry about now is maybe changing the way you approach the whole question. And maybe you've been discerning for a long time. Maybe this is the first thing you've ever done for religious discernment. But it's been there like beneath the surface for years. Maybe you're at a conference when you're younger and you did the altar call thing or, or someone suggested it to you and you kind of ran away from it, but then it keeps popping up. Or if you've been after this for a long time. So very often what we do in our prayer is we approach the Lord and say, okay, God, am I call or not? Uh, give me an answer so I can get on with this. You know, like I can either enter the convent or I can get back to wanting to get married. <clears throat> and um, that's just not always a healthy way. In fact, I'd say quite rarely does God choose to speak into our lives that way. We have some biblical examples where God really does speak very directly and calls a person to himself. But most of those are, are people who were really, really, really important in the like chronology of salvation. And so God needed them to, to have a really clear word. And so he gave that to them. We all want that. We all want God to just tell us, snap right away, exactly what we're supposed to do. But in a way, if God spoke that directly, there's a question of our own freedom. Like, like if I heard God tell me today exactly what to do, would I still be free to not do it? Yes, to a degree, but I'd also be pretty coerced to do what God said because uh, it's God's word. It's God's will for me. And it's really clear in a way. 
God typically vocationally tends to be a little gentler than that directness and, and a little more indirect. And he a journey with us whereby we start to change kind of the landscape of the question. And that's where I was going just a minute ago. Rather than asking God, am I called? Yes or no. And what do I have to do about it? And again, God might answer those questions, but typically he avoids uh, responding directly to those questions. A better question <clears throat> is just about your own heart. And, and the question should use the language of gift. You can, you can look within and search for the Lord there because your heart is his temple by baptism and say, Lord, what's the story with this heart? What's the story with this heart? Because if, if this scripture is true, which we know that it is, what Jesus is telling us is some of your hearts have been made for a type of love that is different than what your nature tells you. Your nature tells you to be married and to have children, and that's very attractive to you. You can feel it even physically, emotionally, intellectually. It has a strong draw because the draw of nature is very strong. It helps the species perpetuate. It keeps us here on earth. At the same time, we have other desires, supernatural desires that are often very gentle and quiet. And if God has, has given a gift for living a different type of love, that's the treasure we want to focus on in, in vocational discernment. And so the question can become, Lord, as I look at my heart, is there a gift here? Because it's really beautiful to think about. But, but what, what God gives in the gift of to one who's given to be a celibate for the kingdom, God gives an ability a supernatural ability to live out love without exercising one's biological, physical, emotional, intellectual powers of love as those, are, those powers are turned toward marriage. In other words, we don't leave our bodies. <clears throat> we don't leave our, our sexuality, our emotions, our personality outside of consecration. If God has called you to consecrated religious life, what he's done is he's shaped your heart in a certain way that you could actually be fulfilled and, and beautifully fulfilled, suppressed by foregoing the natural exercise of your powers for union and for generation, for, for sexual intercourse and for the generation of children. You could be happy without exercising those powers. That's what celibacy does for us, as it were, or that's the shape of that gift. It has like crafted our hearts in a way that we could live without something that nature tells us we need. And in living that way, we could actually be fulfilled. That's a supernatural gift. It's not given to everyone. And it's a very particular thing. I, lately, I've been using the language of, of the shape of the heart because it seems to me that um, when we read the scriptures, the prophet Jeremiah, for example, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I dedicated you a prophet. It seems that God knows, because he's outside of time, from the beginning, he knows that we will exist and then what our hearts are made for or the shape of our hearts, the personality, the specific gifts he's going to give. And so God knows very well what's going to lead this heart and that heart to the expansion that represents uh, the fullness of grace, that represents the type of love that uh, will most fulfill you and most bless the world around you. He already knows that. <clears throat> and so in these hearts that are called to be celibate for the kingdom, it's almost like they have a, a special shape. And it's just a metaphorical shape, I know. But it's a shape by which... Uh, we deduce or we learn that this person doesn't have to go the course of nature and they still will be happy. Uh, if that's there, that's what we're looking for in discernment is asking the Lord, how has he crafted our hearts? Because if that's there, it's a special shape to the heart and God doesn't really withdraw that shape. God doesn't um, change the heart in a way that that gift is no longer there. He put it there for so if you have the gift, which is right now a potential to live chaste, celibate, consecrated love, if you have that, it's not going away. Um, he's not going to pull that out of your heart. And what that means, though, <clears throat> is you do have a choice about your desires, supernatural and natural. You can follow your natural desires and, and get married. And you're still going to be happy. God will bless that and, and, and grant sacramental graces to you and probably a flourishing family. But you're going to carry into your marriage a heart that was shaped with a special gift to live without natural marriage, to live a supernatural bond with God himself in marriage, a spousal to Christ, the divine bridegroom. And see, that shape doesn't really go away. Um, and, and you carry it into marriage in a way that, and I've spoken with many men and many women deep into marriage who explain this. They just have this question about, could there be something more? Or did I miss something? 
was I maybe called and I ran away from it or I didn't explore it. And it's a terrible place to be. And you, as a priest, you just you talk them quickly away from that and say, no, you are in your vocation and you have to live that and, and celebrate it and ask for the grace to flourish there. But beneath that, when they do get down to it, a lot of these people will say, you know, something came up when I was in high school or college. I was afraid of it. I didn't want to talk about it. And I just pushed it away and I got back to dating and here I am. And in the end, there is this question, like maybe maybe they were crafted by God for celibacy and chose um, not to follow that out. They are happy. These people I'm thinking of, a whole host of them come to mind immediately. They have beautiful families, successful marriages, wonderful children, and it's, it's excellent. But they're still kind of wondering. What didn't happen for them was that sort of deeper entrance into the heart to say, God, what is the shape of this heart? How have you made me? And in particular, what type of love have you made me for? And, and is there a gift here for a type of love that is not natural, but supernatural? Because if you've, if you've ever read John Paul II, and he was working with Theology of the Body, he was very helpful in pointing out that every vocation has a spousal meaning. Um, and that's very obvious. The nuptial meaning of marriage is almost redundant. We don't need to say that. But, but marriage is, is characterized by being spousal. Priests and sisters also are granted an invitation into a spousal. The priest stands in the person of Christ, the divine bridegroom, and lays down his life for the church, who is the bride of Christ. The religious woman, distinctly, she receives the love of Christ as her own, that he, he offers himself to her as divine bridegroom and invites her to himself to be exclusively uh, possessed by God in, in a spousal embrace that is fruitful, that, that she is called to bear rich and abundant fruit, that the love that God places within her is meant to, to go forth in the form of generation of life, but supernatural life, children within the embrace of the church. And so if this question in the beginning of, of your journey, or again, wherever you are in the journey, about like, how could I live without marriage? And how could I live without children? I'd be very wary of that question, because that's first off, not what God's asking you to decide right now. Second off, if he's given you this gift, then you're going to be drawn into a marriage. You will be espoused by Christ, by these vows, by your consecration, and with him, you will bear abundant fruit on the supernatural order, not the natural, but it parallels and even achieves a certain fullness that's not possible on the natural plane. And when you talk in great detail, the beauty of what it is Christ, of what it is to have um, no excuse to be anything but entirely given to Jesus. And in that love to recognize how fruitful he is. And how much he blesses her so that she's a blessing to the world. And that she raises up, as it were, other sons and daughters of the Father by inviting people into the church. And by helping the life of God expand in them through her motherhood, her friendship, her sisterhood. So set aside that question about marriage, really. Ask the question about the shape of your heart. And really, is there a gift here, Lord? Because if that gift is there, that's what the Lord wants to get to. Now, some signs of the gift these are harder to spot and it does help to have a spiritual director or someone who can walk with you in this um, and so maybe reach out to your vocation director in your diocese and ask him if he could recommend anyone who um, would be very helpful in working with a woman who's discerning <clears throat> your pastor as well might be very good excuse me just sip of water but we also can just sort of look at our lives and notice um, certain signs of the gift and, and those would be that, you know, we really enjoy prayer or the things of the church. And that when we pray, we tend to experience an increasing intimacy that <clears throat> just seems like there are infinite possibilities down that road. We tend to um, have some kind of desire that the church would, would grow or would be strong and would have a, a stable presence in the world. And we have a, typically we see a desire to, to give of ourselves, to lay it on our lives. Now, we see those things in every, the heart of all the baptized. And so that list is not really conclusive. But when those things are there <clears throat> and we begin to, to ask these questions about vocation, whether the heart is, is given a gift for celibate living, we just notice what happens with those things. And if, if as you begin to engage that question in prayer, and as you do that, as you notice that your desire to pray increases, your delight in the things of the church and the sacramental life grows, your, your willingness to give of yourself to the Lord, to the church, your desire to be ever more deeply converted, those things tend to increase quite rapidly in the heart of someone who's called. 
And that's very often the Lord's language, like, yes, uh, you can keep moving in this direction and I will continue to bless you. To get practical there too, though, uh, I just remind you uh, on the front end, um, I don't need to keep saying the front end because I know maybe some of you have been doing this for a long time, but, but because you're not in convents right now, you're still on the very front end of discernment. Real formal discernment actually involves inviting the church into the conversation because we never should discern alone. A spiritual director is helpful, but then if with the spiritual director's help, or it just is really clear to you already, uh, that you should step forward in discernment, religious communities are designed to help you test that question or test your conclusions to the question. If you believe there's a gift here and that, yep, it's super scary and, and maybe not thoroughly attractive right now to, to forego the things of the world and, and live for heaven by a consecrated life, but there's still a possibility, the church invites you to step forward and engage formal discernment with the church's help. And a religious community is going to help you listen for that voice and help you discern the answer to your questions. And then with you, decide along the way whether or not it seems like that gift for celibate living and fulfillment in celibate living, whether that gift is actually there. See, <clears throat> again, some of you know this, but in order to enter a religious community, you first go on a common see or two or three, and then you might stay for an extended period of time. And then you might enter a phase that's called aspirancy or postulancy. And then after that, which could be a year or two years sometimes, then you might take temporary vows and vows are of poverty, of chastity and obedience. And then each year you'll renew those vows for one year at a time until after uh, many years, you'll make final vows and your life is given to the Lord perpetually. But that process there is, is at your service. In other words, God has so set up the church by the guidance of the Holy Spirit that there's not really a big decision to make right now. The big decision is, will you step forward if it seems like God is open to that? And as you step forward, will you invite the church into it? And the church will help listen with you. And the church will say along the way, <clears throat> we see what you see. We hear what you hear. Or they might say, we don't see that, at least not right now. Or we don't hear that, at least not right now. And they will help you. The religious communities that are, are skilled in this will help you discover, yeah, in fact, uh, I, I do not have this gift that, that I thought I had and maybe I was really afraid of. And I'm free. I'm free to go about the, the life that I grew up dreaming of. I don't have to forego that for an invitation to celebrate living in Christ. The church has helped me draw that conclusion. <clears throat> About discernment, one little bit of advice that a, a religious superior gave me once on, on that question of inviting the church into the process of discernment. She's a, a cloistered nun, and she gave this advice. She said, what happens today is that young women tend to look at the door of marriage and the door of uh, consecrated life. And they notice how strong is the desire for marriage. And so they keep opening that door and peeking through it and wanting to go through it. But the door to religious life is still interesting, attractive to them. And so they try to keep both the doors open and they go back and forth looking at them. And because of the strength of the natural desires, they tend toward um, marriage because it's built into them, as I said. She said what often happens is without adequate exploration of the other door, the movement kind of stabilizes and they, they close off the question to consecrated life, go toward marriage, and then carry that question <clears throat> that I referenced earlier. This religious superior said what actually needs to happen for a woman who's open for her to discern is that she needs to, to open the door to consecrated life and to step through the door. And then she needs to close the door behind her and stay there for a season. And various religious communities say that should be at least three to six months and, and not with the communities, but three to six months of not dating uh, and, and trying to, to keep custody of the eyes, you know, and avoid kind of the imagination toward marriage and sort of sit down and act like God has called you to religious life. You, you go through that door and you close it. And she was quick to say the door's not locked. You're not stuck there. You're not even discerning with a religious community necessarily yet, but you've decided to stand before the Lord and say, okay, God, I'm going to begin to act like I'm called to consecrated life, poverty, chastity, and obedience. And I'm going to observe how you respond to me, Lord. Because what the Lord does is if that's the pathway toward consecrated life, he blesses you there. And you find that certain things that didn't seem possible become possible, that you notice your heart growing and peace is increasing and a little bit of a desire might be there that wasn't there or it was covered over before and it's begun to sprout and grow. This is how God tends to respond to us when we are engaging a vocational discernment about celibate living or consecrated life. 
then along that road that entails visiting a couple of communities or, or speaking with their vocation directors and maybe making a formal come and see, which is the, typically the name communities use for when you come and see what it's like to be there. What you do is you just go and, and you visit with the community and you, again, in your prayer, observe what happens in your heart. And one sister helped me a long time ago in understanding uh, some very simple language for that. She said, we're looking for a woman when she comes here. We're trying to help her figure out if God's calling her to be here. And so it's often much simpler than trying to get into very technical language or intellect aging a long inventory of questions. So we're just looking to see how God responds to her and he's going to bless her if he wants her here. And, and this woman said, what that means is she will be able to, to sleep when she comes to stay with us on a retreat. She'll be able to eat. She'll have an appetite. She'll be able to laugh and she'll be able to pray. If we see those four things, she said, then we know that this could be a home for her because we're all searching for home. You know, all of us are searching for home and our heavenly home is on the horizon. We ache for it. We don't know how to get there. <clears throat> If the Lord's called you to religious life, he's going to invite you to make a visit or two, and he's going to show you if that's something of a for you, if that's where he wants you to be. And what's going to happen there is you're going to be happy, <laughs> even if it's not the most attractive thing to you now. And if it's not your calling, you're, you're not going to be happy. You're going to have trouble sleeping and, and praying and laughing, and you're, you're going to eventually just want to leave. <clears throat> and that's going to be a sign from the Lord that you don't need to be here. He's not going to demand something of you that's arduous and horrible. He's going to invite you to something that's beautiful, free, and full because it's a gift. And so what we want to do around this question of discernment is back to the beginning here to push to the highest level in a sense or be like, God, I'll give you everything if you want it. And notice what happens there. And with time, especially if we spend a little season of discernment, again, these communities say three to six months or so of like formally committing to a discernment, we'll just notice what happens in our hearts. And if the Lord wants you to keep going, he's going to make that clear. You're going to feel better about it. If he doesn't want you to keep going, he's going to gently press you in the other direction. Because the last thing God wants is for you to be in a habit with vows if you're not called. And that's also the last thing the church wants and the last thing that these communities want. But he wants the same thing here, starting with God. And that is that you would be fully alive, that you would be free and, and in love with God and in love with, with creation wanting to perfect it according to the plan that is established in Christ Jesus for us in the new covenant. God is on our side for that. He's not an opponent here. He's not making demands of us to, to take things from us. And if he does want us to give him things, it's because he sees that they're in the way of our being happy in the end. And we're just confused about why we're holding on to it so firmly or why we think we need it when in reality um, it's crippling us or it's captured us. So these are some, some basic technicals around um, vocational discernment. Uh, just to, to be practical, there's so much more to say. Um, and I love this topic. I'm actually working on a book uh, uh, on this, which will have two chapters on celibacy that'll contain a lot of this stuff, because I just think we don't have the right language sometimes to help a young woman, especially realize that her heart, her heart is made for love. And if Jesus is going to call her to himself, he's going to call her as a woman who he wants to consecrate for himself. And you're not going to leave behind your femininity. You're not going to leave behind your maternity. You're not going to leave behind your emotions, as complicated as they can be sometimes, your dreams and desires and aspirations, as lofty as they can be sometimes. He's going to take all of that and draw it up into this consecration. And, and where the, <clears throat> the married woman pours her life into her spouse and the life that they bear in children it is such a gift to them that it causes laughter and joy along with tears and a lot of lost sleep. And it's the beauty of the home. If the, if the Lord invites a woman to forego that, he takes all of the same desires and he draws them up into himself. And where, where the naturally married and sacramentally bonded woman binds herself to her spouse by the, the covenant bond of marriage, the, the woman called to consecrated life instead binds herself to Christ. And he takes those same desires and he breaks them open. Desires to, to be given, desires for love, for intimacy with God, desires to bear life, fruit, children. He breaks those open for the whole church and her maternity is, is made, as it were, a universal gift. That, that what the natural woman pours into her home um, is broken open and poured out for the whole church in consecrated life. And that's why we need sisters so badly, because we priests can't do that. I can only talk about motherhood, spiritual motherhood, and, and spiritually bridal fecundity. I can teach you about those things all day. 
but you and religious women who are, are consecrated can live that and demonstrate it and show it to the world. And that's what the church is. The church is the bride of Christ, right? And so we need these women consecrated after the heart of Mary as bride of Christ in order to, to teach us who we are as a church. So to that end, <clears throat> I, I wanted to land on giving you practical advice. I have two books to recommend to you written by women who will be better guides than I in this to you. Um, I offer a complimentary approach um, and probably more direct than, than these women will be because you are so good at um, walking with each other in the, the elegance of the, the feminine heart, knowing it from within as you do. And I speak as a man from the outside of that. But a, a real treasure of a book on, on where the, the feminine heart consecrated lives out that womanliness. It's a book called um, My Beloved is Mine and I Am His. And Beth has that for, uh, she'll put that up in the, in the text. It's by Mother Mary Francis. My Beloved is Mine and I Am His. It's a really beautiful set of meditations that this cloistered woman gave to her sisters about womanhood and womanliness. And my favorite quote from the whole thing, as far as a short quote goes, it says, we do not leave our womanhood at the door. We bring it with us to hear flourish and be perfected. That's a very, very important thing to consider in religious discernment, that if God is calling you to himself, he's calling you as a woman to himself, and he's not gonna leave aside your womanhood, he's gonna consecrate it and he's gonna expand it <clears throat> so the world can be blessed through the way you love and receive his love and let it bear fruit in you. That's Mother Mary Francis. <clears throat> the other book is very practical, a Discerning Religious Life. It's by Mother Mary, uh, Mother, Mother Claire Mathias. She is a uh, CFR, and uh, Beth has that as well, Discerning Religious Life. And that is just a very practical book written by a religious superior who dealt with these questions over and over and over again and finally said, maybe I'll just put these in a book so that everyone has the basic answers to all the things. Should I date? Should I get a spiritual director? What does it look like to live as a comp? cloister religious was looking to be an active religious all these little questions so recommend both of those to you um, as practical resources uh, just the last couple practical things and then i want to take some of your questions the first and then the foremost is that um, we can't do any vocational discernment without an interior life we we end up just guessing and trying to figure out and calculate and be methodical about how we'll make our lives the best they could be have to have a deep interior life and that starts with daily prayer and it starts small if you're not praying every day start with like 15 minutes a day of just sitting down and being quiet sharing your heart with the lord and letting him share his heart with you and it's something of a dialogue a back and forth intimate conversation between friends is how saint Teresa defines prayer that has to be there at the outset or we will never really be assured that the voices we're hearing are God. It's still hard to discern, um, even when we pray all day on retreat, whether it's God's voice, mine, or the voice of the world. <clears throat> but if the prayer life is not there, we can't discern. So that's the basic foundation. The second is um, the journey of healing. And maybe you wouldn't think about that uh, at the in the context of a discernment conversation, but um, each of us carries a, a set of wounds, a lot of wounds, because it's just life in the flesh. Uh, our families were not perfect. Our friends were not perfect. We were not perfect along the way. All of those wounds have really serious implications and they confuse us about who we are, about who other people are and about who God is. And, and when that confusion is there, it's very difficult to, to listen. And it's very difficult even to trust our hearts and to believe that we could want good things in an ordered fashion that would actually make us happy because we've got a lot of experience of following our hearts and making big mistakes. So the healing journey has to begin and that sort of thing can't wait for religious formation. You can't say, I'll deal with my mess once I'm in the convent because we bring our mess anywhere we go with us. And, and there's a lot that can be done out here. Um, Be Healed by Dr. Bob Schutz has been a really helpful book for me, as well as his retreats, Healing the Whole Person. And he's just coming out with a new book right now on uh, sexual trauma, healing from sexual trauma, which is going to be very, very important. But just um, be willing to engage the healing journey especially in the process of um, establishing a chaste way of living. Uh, because in chastity, we see the Lord. Uh, when, when our hearts are impure, we can't see God. And so we'll always be confused about all of that, who we are, who others are, who God is. And then finally, in this whole reality, um, just be sure to look at God more than um, your life. In other words, we can sometimes get stuck, you know, trying to make these lists of pros and cons and remembering things we loved and things we didn't love and knowing what we're good at and bad at. And we just get into this list making mindset where we like want to see which way the scales tip. That ends up being kind of navel gazing and can be a little bit obsessive. We just want to look at the Lord and we have to do some of that, you know, because God speaks through our stories 
and we do have certain gifts. And if you don't have a certain gift, that's clear you shouldn't do a certain type of life and you might be better at this or that. <clears throat> but in the end, it's in God that we find ourselves. And so that daily prayer, the most fruitful thing that will happen there is if your intention is to place your life in God and just to abide in God and to entrust yourself to him formally by, by prayers of surrender or acts of surrender and just saying yourself to you. You know what you made me for. You already know what's going to make me happy. Just help me to follow you. I want to follow you more closely so that I can end up in the life that you dream of for me, that you established at the very beginning when you knew what my future was going to look like, full of hope and the promise again of Jeremiah. So just spend time like looking at the Lord. And at times, if you can use images um, or even just metaphors to, to look at God looking at you and search his face and search his heart for how he sees you and what he sees you, sees you flourishing and what type of love he's made you for. You will find yourself in him more than you'll find yourself um, searching in your story and within yourself. And we keep a balance again with the healing journey there, but very simply strive to place your life in him and to look at him more than you look at yourself. And in the end, that will be the way that he teaches you how to love what he loves and to want what he wants, which in the end is just what makes us happy. So I think I am at um, the agreed upon time that uh, I was going to try and keep it to 30 minutes. I'm a little longer than that. So <clears throat> I'll have Beth come back because I think there are some questions. And um, yep, Rachel just sent out the name of Bob Shoot's book. <clears throat> but we will come to those questions that were sent in a little while ago. And Beth is here. Hi, Father. Thank you so, so much. Uh, yeah, Jenna and I were just standing here the whole time saying, wow, yes. It just resonates with our experience and uh, everything you shared just really made us want to go and pray. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, we do actually have a lot of really good questions. So I want to kind of dive right in. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. No, it's great. Let me get my okay, let's, let's do it. Um, yeah, I, I'm going to start here because I think this is really uh a, a basic distinction to make. What is the difference between having a call to religious life and deep intimacy with Christ? Uh, that's a great question. Um, like I said before, all of us are called to holiness. We're also called to, um, in holiness, to divine intimacy, to be uh, to be known by God profoundly, uh, to, to let God know us and let God really uh, reveal us to ourselves, uh, to show us our hearts, show us what we're made for. Um, you can't really rank or compare the two, but um, there is a certain level of divine intimacy to which a consecrated person is called that a married person. Did. And um, we find this in the scriptures. It's when St. Paul in the first, he's giving this advice to, to married people. And um, he talks about the undivided heart. And what he says is the unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly affairs, how to please his wife, and his interests are divided. And he does the same thing about the unmarried woman or the virgin. So what he's saying is the celibate person has no excuse to not give God everything and to, to, to they have no excuse to hold anything kingdom for the proclamation of the gospel. They have to. It's, it's their life. The married person, rightly so, is concerned for those things of God, but also have duties and blessed obligations of holy matrimony to their spouse and their children. And so they can't uh, pour the same amount of attention and energy into growth in the Lord and the life of charity because they, they rightly are divided. They have to be about the things of their family, whereas the, the celibate has foregone the natural family and so has no excuse to be, to be um, but to be fully for that. So you, you find a, a degree of intimacy that is, is uh, greater in consecrated life, but mm -hmm. you don't need to compare them because if it's not the call, then, um, you know, if you're trying to fake marriage or trying to fake religious life, the graces aren't going to be there to get to the depth of intimacy that would be normative for those lives. Yes. I love but that. Also, talking about the eschatological sign. Sorry. <clears throat> no, sorry. I interrupted you. Oh, no. Uh, <clears throat> just this very beautiful thing about celibate, not the catechism, but again, we don't too often. When Jesus is talking about marriage. Um, he's another question he's asked about this woman who's been married multiple times, who's she going to be married to in heaven? Because he's trying to get, they're trapping him or trying to trap him in divorce questions again. And he says in heaven, like the angels, they will not be giving in marriage. There will not be new marriages. 
that in, in heaven will be like the angels. Confusing word at first, but what he's saying is there's no such thing as a new marriage in heaven. Marriage comes about here. Recognize that we are incomplete in ourselves, that we need someone else to complete us <clears throat> and someone else to call us to a higher level and raise us up. And so most people being uh, called to marriage do that in a natural sense. A celibate person is called to marriage with God. And so they give of themselves in a similar but a supernaturally um, different fashion. They give themselves to God. So they live kind of the future state that we're all going to live. In heaven, we're all going to be so satisfied because nothing's going to be missing anymore that we won't be married. It doesn't mean for those of you who are married <clears throat> that you'll like forget your spouse. Um, you'll, you'll know who your spouse was and, and the love of your life will, will show through the mm -hmm. shape of your soul as it were. But there won't be new marriages and there won't be a need for marriage the way there is now because we will see God and our will will rest. We won't desire anything else. So the celibate person, male or female, is called to kind of almost like pull that down off the horizon or let God pull them up into that horizon to give themselves to God in a consecrated way so that they sort of live heaven here and now. Hmm. And celibate love is meant to be a sign of the future, it's meant to be the way we be in heaven. And so we're supposed to, boy, uh, a fervor, a zeal that foreshadows heaven. And, and because of that, and because of the grace that comes about through this kind of more intimate bond that we're consecrated or invited to share with God, we would say that there's a, a difference in degree between marriage and consecrated life as to divine intimacy, um, but also the horizon, because we're supposed to be sort of living heaven on earth and be beacons of the joy of what that is. That's what a holy priest and a holy sister does. So just to kind of round out some theology there. Yeah. Uh, no, that's amazing. Thank you. Um, Father, I have a couple of different iterations of this question. Um, I'd love to just ask a little bit about parents, uh, yeah. whether it's broaching the subject of discerning religious life with parents who are not practicing or are anti-Catholic even, uh, or even parents who love the Lord, but are deeply grieved to think about the separation of a, a daughter going to religious life. Any, um, any thoughts or direction there? Yeah, <clears throat> that one's so deep on my heart um, to everyone who asked it. And also just to, to women in general, <clears throat> because we, you know, like if your parents are Catholic, they see a priest every weekend and maybe more than that, you know, and they go to mass. And so they could have an idea, even if they don't really want it, they could have an idea of what it'd be like for their son to be a priest. It's typically not the case that we have contact with religious women um, who are around the same age as the daughters that these parents are worried about. They might remember when they grew up having sisters in the school, but a lot of dioceses we don't have now. And so the idea of a woman going off to that makes almost no sense. And because they don't have often quite the visible life that the priest does, in sort of secular terms or just like more worldly approach to things like, well, you're wasting your life. Like there's not even fruit to show. The priest at least preaches and I can, I can hear him and he can teach. The sister maybe doesn't even have those apostles. Maybe she's cloistered and she lives in a cloister for the rest of her life and I can only see her once in a while. Why would I want my daughter to do that? So it's a, a very painful struggle for parents and for women in discernment. So if your parents um, are, are not open to this, this idea, uh, do not despair because this idea is God's. If it's a calling from God, it's his idea. And he thought it up a long time ago and he sees how your family got to where it is. And he will be the one to sort of untangle all that as will be our lady undoer of not. She's a huge help in this. But um, <clears throat> we need to pray for parents. And if it's your parents, just offer prayer and sacrifice that the Lord will show you when to speak and when not to speak and what to speak about versus what to just wait on. But in, in pragmatic terms, you can also help them remember the things that I shared here about the, the chronology of discernment and formation, that you're going to wake up tomorrow, a religious sister in a habit. It's a long journey. And your parents are going to be on it with you in part. You'll be away, but you'll come home multiple times. And as that happens, they're going to notice the inevitable, which you're also noticing, which is that you're getting happier. And, and in the end, if they love you, which you know they do, they want you to be happy. And so they're going to see that and they might not like the life, but they're not going to want to refute that. They're going to see, and you're going to testify to it, that you are, are growing and that you're finding home and that it's delightful. And so Jesus will lead you in how to testify to that and how to, how to talk through that. If you're on the very front end, it can be just uh, <clears throat> a 
looking up also some videos online. Like a lot of these communities, and there's some podcasts now too that you can just share with your parents and they can get to hear and see these sisters in their communities and realize like, okay, they're normal <laughs> and they're happy and they're beautiful and they're free and they're alive. And I want all those things for my daughter too. So maybe this isn't so strange an idea. That's at our service today in a way that wasn't before. But so just a couple of practicals. But um, whatever you do, don't despair in that place, I said. It's a very heavy struggle. I've seen the Lord take care of parents so beautifully. Sometimes it takes years. Sometimes it's very quick. But Jesus will take care of that if he wants you to be his bride. He will take care of your parents. And he'll show you how that's going to be. Beautiful. Thank you, Father. Um uh, one question, uh, maybe if you can just speak to this briefly, uh, someone asked, um, when is it too late to discern? I know there are certain religious communities that have um, age restrictions. Kind of what do we do with that? Yeah, that's a great practical question. And um, <clears throat> there are two, kind of two groupings of, of religious communities in the, uh, the U.S., two kind of councils, CMSWR and LCWR. Uh, maybe you don't need to go too far down that road, but you can contact the leadership of these community or these, these kind of organizational bodies and ask them for advice with respect to your age group. Some of these religious communities, especially the ones in the CMSWR, they often um, <clears throat> will not take women after a certain, because they've learned in formation that this is the sort of the process of the apostles and the sermon that happens that you, you start as a young woman with a cohort, you stay together for life. Other communities um, will take people second career, um, even married people who uh, have lost a spouse or divorced and annulled. Um, that's very specific to each community. Um, and so you can go on, on any of these websites, and just kind of look around and get a sense for that and even reach out to them and, and say, uh, you know, I'm this age. <clears throat> Is it feasible for me to consider discerning with your community? If not, do you know of communities that I might reach out to? Uh, <clears throat> then also, there are all other kinds of states in life. There's consecrated virginity um, that for, for older women who have lost husbands who, you know, maybe don't feel called to go join a convent, but they do want to live a sort of vow, a consecration. The order of widows is a way of, of committing to living a form of poverty in the world. And then there's, there's all these other, you know, Renum Christi and Opus Dei, forms of single life that are committed to chastity and living in the world, uh, but for the gospel. And all of that can happen really at any age. So just a kind of a, a whole range of answers there. But um, the best contact would be these religious communities and they can either help you understand yes or no, but also uh, who to reach out to if your age kind of falls outside of, of their typical range. <clears throat> Father, thank you so much. I know our camera's given us a little trouble. Can you still hear me? Yep, hear you. Oh, okay. you're, you're Gosh, frozen. I'm so I'm so grateful for that answer. Um, just gives a lot of hope, you know, and reminds me how unique each of our vocation journeys are, uh, even though there are uh, maybe a few paths or, or a broad path of religious life, it's gonna be unique for each and every one of us walking it. Yeah, and that's like, for you women, that's where the journey is both harder and more beautiful than it is for us men. Because for guys, it's like, you know, there's a priestly call. He typically approaches the diocesan vocation director and discerns diocesan religious life. He might later, <clears throat> or maybe originally, he might decide to go a specific route, Dominican or Jesuit. Um, but there tend to be fewer kind of mainline religious communities of men. There's no like real equivalent on the women's side. There's no like general diocesan religious community all across the country. It's always based on a charism. Every community has a specific, usually a founder or foundress, and a specific way of living out the council's poverty, chest, and obedience, and living out the gospel. You know, you'll have the Sisters of Life uh, on the next unit. They focus on building up the culture of life and the dignity of the human person and beauty. Um, the missionaries of charity, their main focus is being with the poorest of the poor. Um, the, the Franciscans, you know, living in the streets of gospel poverty based on St. Francis. So um, you have this like plethora of options and that could be daunting at the beginning of discernment, but that is a place where you can say like, what do I love and why do I love it? And if that love is always being purified in my interior life, that sometimes will represent a degree of how to deliberate what a charism might be or which communities could help you on the basis of their focal points or their charism. They might be able to 
be more helpful to you in, in listening to the shape of your own heart with the Lord. But that's so that's why it's more beautiful. It's more challenging. There's a lot of options, but it's also like very specific and so personal. And so it's yeah. the Lord doesn't repeat himself there. Thank you, Father. Thanks for saying that. Um, if you're still game, I've got maybe just two more really good questions for you. Um, what if you discover that you're called to celibacy, but you can't join consecrated life because of family responsibilities or things beyond our control? Yeah, that's a pretty particular question, but it's a good one. I think it, a lot would depend on the state in life. Um, mm. So Christ talks about in that scripture I cited, some who by nature are celibate. Um, what can happen is our, our potencies for generation can cease working naturally. And it can become clear that God is inviting us to um, chastity or continence, it's called really, where we abstain from sexual activity. And we do that for religious reasons. Now, that's a tricky conversation because within marriage, um, that would have to be a pretty clear uh, situation where you're, you're called to abstain from sexual intercourse within marriage because it's it's a part of marriage. There needs to be the expression of love so far as possible in bodily form, as well as intellectual and emotional. Um, <clears throat> if it's outside of marriage, it can very well be the case that the Lord is just inviting someone to give their whole heart to him. And it's not quite clear if that's supposed to be formalized in a consecration with a religious community or just life in the world. Consecrated virginity, which we haven't even really talked about, is right. ancient. From the very beginning, virgins have consecrated their virginity to the Lord, um, and that's always there too. So there's this kind of whole range of, of different responses. Typically, the Lord uh, leads a person to formalize that commitment. Um, sometimes that question can come out of a fear or a, a range of really difficult relationships in the past with men and can lead someone to just want to avoid all of that and, and just try to, to live a single life. If it's the Lord who's inviting that, he'll typically invite someone to formalize that life by membership in an association, typically also by a vow or a covenant or a promise. And that's what you kind of watch for is like, Lord, I don't feel called to marriage. Is that out of fear or is that out of a calling to you to something else? And then we kind of watch along that journey how he invites that to become more specific or, or formalized in a, a real commitment. That was so helpful. Thank you, Father. Uh, and I, I wonder, I know that was pretty specific and, I, and I've asked some that maybe uh, some questions that apply to some women and not others. So maybe the most important question I'll ask you is how would you go about finding a spiritual director if you are discerning a call to religious life? Yeah, great question. Um, and this is one of the poverties of the church right now. We're like just short on, well, we're short on everything, I guess, in a way we're poor, but um uh, priests who are able to give spiritual direction, you know, have the resources and the interest and the ability, because it's kind of a gift. Not every priest really feels called to offer formal spiritual direction. Some priests just have a gift for the discernment of spirits, and they're really good at helping a person listen for the movements of the Holy Spirit in their life. Um, I kind of referenced before that on this question in particular, the diocesan vocation director, where you're from, will, will be a good resource at the start. He himself, uh, I've talked to multiple vocation directors in the last year who heard what we're doing and are starting to do the same thing. Um, and, and they're learning how to put their resources, even though their, their focus by assignment is on the house of priesthood. They've got many women inquiring. Uh, and I just would say that to the whole group, like you are not alone in asking these questions. It was at the last gathering of uh, vocation directors, probably the number one conversation outside of the, the large gatherings was what are you doing for the women? Because we're getting so many calls. So it really yeah. does feel like a movement right now that the Lord is making to invite more and more women into discernment and eventually into consecration. So your diocesan vocation director, you won't be the first one to reach out to him. So he might himself have resources for you. He might know some priests in the diocese who are helpful. If there's a religious community of priests in your diocese, we have Carmelites here and they're excellent spiritual directors. Sometimes the Jesuits, if you have a university in your town, um, but I would, I think a good starting point is the vocation director and just ask his advice and maybe he's willing to engage it with you. Otherwise he might be able to point you in a, a direction. It's also the possibility that you can, you know, um, call up your, or, or get in touch with the vocation director of one of the communities and ask their advice. And they might have some priests they would recommend, even if it's just over the phone, who could, um, walk you through the beginning phases. So you eventually are able to, to go into 
Yeah. But that's a tough one. It's a big one. And a lot of the time people aren't actually looking for spiritual direction. They're just looking for advice or spiritual friendship mm-hmm. or counsel. But when we talk about vocational discernment, we're talking about a director who's who's really going to, um, we're going to step into a relationship of, of obedience and willingness to follow the directives he or she would issue. Um, we have some wonderful female spiritual directors here in Milwaukee as well. Um, we have a consecrated virgin and as well as a bunch of lay people who uh, have all gotten certified recently. So there's actually some more resources than you think, but typically priest is a little bit harder. Mm, yeah. Thank you, Father. Yeah. Uh, Father, I could honestly go on and on with the questions, but I think we might end our conversation for today here. But I want to extend just a little uh, hope to all of you and invite you again next month. We'll be back. Uh, come and see. This is not a one-time uh thing for us. We really want it to be a campaign, an ongoing source of support and prayer. Um, And we want to introduce you to some really vibrant, healthy, beautiful uh, women's religious sisters and and their communities. So our hope, our desire here at Blessed Is She is to have conversations like this once a month. Uh, So next month, we'll be here with two of the Sisters of Life Sister Anuste and Sister Veritas. You might've heard them on the Let Love podcast. And they'll be chatting with us about their own vocation stories, as well as discernment uh, and answering your questions. So we wanna invite you every month uh, to join us for as long as we can find sisters who will sit down and share their story with us. uh, We want to invite you into those conversations too. Oh, I'm so glad you guys are excited about it. Yeah, yeah isn't that amazing? So, like a dream come yeah. true. Like th- this is happening is a dream for me. Like that we could normalize the question of vocational discernment so that everybody finds to the Lord's will without you look back and wonder. Like this is such important work that you're doing here. And just, yeah, I will be interceding for all of you and for all of this. And uh, if I can sit in on the future ones, maybe I will, because <laughs> those are good friends of mine too. And they're just doing such beautiful work, some of these sisters. So. Uh, let's pray for each other too. Let's remember um, just to lift up everybody who joined us. You know, we don't know what questions were raised up in each of the hearts who came today, but there's a good chance something brand new struck you in a new way and take that to prayer, but but know that your your sisters, as it were here, will also pray for you. And so let's just not skip over that in the days to come. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Father. Yeah, so mark your calendars. Our next date is February 13th, same time, 1 p.m. Eastern. We'll be streaming on Uh, Facebook, on YouTube, and uh, we would love for you to join us and the Sisters of Life next month. And Father, you are always welcome. I'm sure I'll be coming at you with all kinds of questions in between. We're just so grateful for uh, your heart, your care, your fatherly care for us. Um, And could I ask you to close us in a prayer? Of course, love to. Thank you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, we love you. And again, we in this prayer just acknowledge our hearts, knowing that uh, even just in the small time we've shared, something has changed within us because you are here. You are alive and breathing in us by your Holy Spirit that you move us to contemplate eternal good more perfectly. Thank you for being affected in us, Lord, and we ask you to help us be aware of our hearts to acknowledge them before you, especially as we go to prayer after this. Help us to see what you've done, Lord, and to not be afraid of it. Whenever you seem to be speaking beneath words, grant us just a a deeper trust and a willingness to, to let you lead us by the heart, to let you draw us forth along the pathway that you've set for us, the pathway to heaven. Help us to keep our gaze upon you and not the obstacles and not the fears and the concerns of a tomorrow that may never come. But rather, in this moment and in every moment to come, let us just look at you, Lord, and, and allow you to convict us in your deep love, to teach us about how beloved we are to you and how much you want to bring us to fullness, to flourishing, to freedom, to life. I ask that you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon these women who have gathered here this day, Lord. Seal their hearts and the blessings and graces you have bestowed anoint them with your gifts and draw them into a deeper interior life. They would be unafraid to follow you ever more closely. They would be generous in responding to you and offering everything back to you. And that they would become like Mary, 
women filled to the brim with love, with chaste and holy and pure self-oblation, and with a zeal for the kingdom that allows her to suffer and to rejoice. Dear Mama Mary, please teach these women your own heart in this way and pray for them as they step forth along this journey. My dear sisters, through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary, her Immaculate Heart, the love, the fatherhood, the protection of St. Joseph, the intercession of your guardian angels, your patron and patroness saints, all the holy men and women who have gone before us. May Almighty God heal you, anoint you, and bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank Thanks you, so much. What a gift to be with you all. I'm so pleased. Oh, gosh, for us too. Thank you, Father. And thanks to all of you. We loved this time with you. And remember, we're here to support you, to walk with you, and always to pray for you. Um, so thanks for coming and finding a home here in the Blessed Is She Sisterhood. We will see you next month. Thanks, Father. Bye, friends. Bye. God bless you.